Hey there, Dan Gastu here. Today's video is about installing a solar cell into a boat and is proudly sponsored by MarineEngine.com. Last week I went through adding a voltage sensitive relay between the two batteries in my dual battery setup and today we're going to be going through adding a solar cell and a charge controller. The solar cell I'm going to be adding is reasonably large so we're going to have a few challenges on how and where to mount it but I think I've got some ideas for that. What I'll start with though is making up a small panel for the controller to go on as well as the override switch that I added last week. I'm going to be using one of these charge controllers in this setup. You often see discussion about whether a charge controller is needed at all and the general consensus is if it's a reasonably large you know car battery boat battery and it's a small 10 watt sort of solar cell then you can pretty much just hook it up and get away without it because i'm using a 60 watt solar cell i definitely need one because the solar cell is capable of putting about five amps into the battery on a bright sunny day but i'd kind of recommend having one all the time and there's a few reasons for that one is this wasn't very expensive it was about 40 dollars and it gives you some information and some protection. It protects the battery from being overcharged, which is kind of the primary purpose of them. It also has the facility to hook your loads up to this controller, and it will actually disconnect those loads if the battery voltage is getting too low. So it's got a way of protecting the battery from being over discharged as well as being overcharged. On top of that, it gives you an LED indicator as to whether it's receiving current from the solar cell. So if it's a sunny day and that LED is out, then you know something's wrong with your setup. So instead of just having your battery go flat, thinking it's doing something that's not, you'll know straight away. Because it's also monitoring the battery itself, it'll give you an indication of your battery health. And then also, if you have your devices hooked up to this controller, it'll let you know whether you're drawing current or whether it's disconnected due to an overdraw. So it'll detect whether it tries to draw too much current. So it acts as a little bit of a circuit breaker as well. So to me, it's quite a bit of functionality to get for $40. In order to mount the solar cell I'm about to put in, I need to push my batteries back under that toolbox. So what I'm going to do while I'm here is make up a little lead to go from the controller to the battery. That way I can run that through, hook it up to the batteries, put them away, and then we'll start installing the rest of the stuff. It doesn't need to go too far, so just a metre or so of 10 amp cable, which is twice what the solar cell can put out, so it should be fine. Just going to strip a fair bit of this outer casing off because I need to be able to reach the two terminals. This controller just has a set of screws here that clamp down onto the wires so I'm just going to bare the other end. All right little patch lead ready to go. Now what I'm going to do is take this and the original battery switch I installed and mount them onto a block of timber so I can put that inside the toolbox on the boat. There's two things I've got to do before I can put the batteries back under this toolbox. The first is I have to attach that little patch lead I made to the battery so that it can go to the solar controller. The other is to drill a hole up through the bottom of the toolbox because there's not enough height inside to get the drill in. So I'll do those two things now. So that lead's now connected to the starting battery. So the motor and the solar cell will charge the starting battery and then the VSR will let the house battery get charged as well. Now, just gonna use a hole saw to drill up through the bottom of the toolbox. All right, um, I've done a hole about this size because I've got about six leads to get through. What I'm gonna do now is grab a little bit of vacuum hose, cut it open and use it as a grommet to protect the edge so that the wires don't chafe on the new cut. So there's the hole up and the batteries will be just below there. All right, just gonna cut it with some hose cutters. And then carefully, without cutting myself, just going to slit it down the center with a razor blade. I'm gonna cut along the outside edge of the curve it naturally has from being on the roll because that's the side that's gonna push onto the metal. All right, cut along. And now I'm just gonna push it onto the metal edge. All right, then that's my little bit of vacuum hose pushed on to stop the wires chafing. 
Now I'm going to go underneath and push the wires up through here so we can start attaching them to our switching controller. All right, after a lot of uh, sweating and swearing, I now have the batteries under there and we also have our cables coming up in here. So I'm going to attach the two main cables to the battery switch first. We'll screw it down to this timber and then we're going to hook this cable up to the battery in on our controller. Now I've got those two wires hooked up and you can see the battery light is green and the load light is red. So we'll go see what those lights indicate. Okay, so the green light on the battery is saying that the battery is fully charged, has greater than 13.4 volts. Orange is okay, 12.4 to 13.4. Red is low and flashing red is fully discharged. So that's good to know. So the red LED on for the load output is saying that the load output is active. So if we connect something to it, we'll get power. If it's off, we won't. If it's slow flashing, it means it's been overload. And if it's fast flashing, it means it's detected a short circuit. Now this controller has a setup mode, so we can actually switch load output off, which I would do if I wasn't using it. So I'll have a think about how I might use it, because I think it's a great feature. But if I wasn't using it, I would definitely just switch it off. All right, last thing to do is connect the solar cell to the controller. So I'll show you what it's got in the way of connectors. So the solar cell comes with these types of connectors. And these are great because they let you link multiple solar cells in series or parallel, depending on whether you've got a 12 volt, 24 volt system, whatever. But in my case, I'm not gonna use these. So I'm simply gonna cut them off and just connect the bare wires. If I was getting super serious about it, I probably would go and buy some of these connectors, but no time. These leads are still marked with some tags for positive and negative, so no chance of getting them confused. All right, let's talk a little bit about mounting the solar cell. One of the main considerations when mounting a solar cell, obviously, is that it faces the sun, more or less. You also don't want the solar cell in any shade, so if it's a sailing boat with a lot of rigging, then you want to make sure you get as much clear sunlight as possible, but obviously it's a compromise, but that's what you're aiming for. Now, the Earth is considered by most people to be round, and this is kind of important in the sense that if you live on the equator, pointing your solar cell straight up means that it's pointing pretty much at the sun. And that angle changes as you get to the poles to the point where you start almost pointing it at the horizon if you want to see the sun. So knowing your latitude can kind of help in choosing the angle you point it at. So Sydney is 33 degrees around. So for me, the ideal angle is to actually have it up at 33 degrees and get it close to pointing towards the sun. Now, because the Earth's on a tilted axis, yes, it changes season to season, but it gets you in the ballpark. So my plan is to mount it on the back of the toolbox, which rather than being flush like this, pointing at the horizon, is actually angled out so it'll point up slightly. I also, most of the time during the day, have the boat moored with the stern facing towards the north, which is where our sun comes from, being in the southern hemisphere. So it should work out pretty well. My plan is to have some hinges attached to the top here so that I can actually lift the solar cell up if I need to get under to get to the batteries or fuel. Then the rest of the time I'm going to have it resting against here with some rubber stops and a little bit of elastic shock cord to stop it bouncing around. These are the hinges I'm going to put on. They're 304 stainless, which isn't great. They definitely need to be stainless. I see so many boats where people have put mild steel, gal zinc plated, it just doesn't last. The hooks I'm going to use to attach the shock cord are 316, which is better, but you know, this is all I can get. I'm going to rivet these hinges onto the top edge of the solar cell first, then I'll attach them to the boat. I'm going to put a little block under here so that if, as I drill, I accidentally go through, don't damage the solar cell. Ah, which reminds me, this is the test pace and butt joint I made that I never put in the press to break and see how it broke, so we'll do that soon. It's reminded me. I'm just putting the second rivet in the other hole loosely to stop the hinge pivoting while I do this first rivet up. I also bought some little stick-on rubber pads, if you see those like that. So I'm going to put a couple of those down the outside frame so it's not metal on metal.
So, riveted on. Gives me access to underneath still. And I think I mentioned in a previous video, I put these rubber stops here so that when I open this lid, it stays level rather than falling at an angle. So it makes a good table for cutting bait and that kind of thing. But it also means there's a gap between the top of the solar cell and this because of those rubber stoppers. Hinge is all done. Then what I've got is just some hooks onto the side here. And if I unhook this, unlike the other side, these are just loops of shock cord I've got through the frame. And those bits of elastic, when they're on, should stop this flapping around too much. And then I've got my little rubber stoppers here as well, so it doesn't hit metal on metal. So, it should be right. Alright, now I'm going to push the positive and negative leads from the solar cell up through into the toolbox, and we'll connect it to the controller. Now I've got the solar cell hooked up, we've got the sun LED flashing fast by the looks of it. So we'll go see what that means. So with the green LED, it says off means there's no sunlight or not enough for it to charge the battery. Fast flashing, which I think is what it's doing now, is saying it's doing a bulk charge, which doesn't surprise me. Although the voltage was high and the battery was showing good, I'm pretty sure one of those batteries is a bit low, so that could be the reason. On is doing an absorption charge, and slow flashing is doing a float charge. So an absorption charge is the second stage of the charging process where it's sort of getting close to full and a float charge is sort of a maintenance charge, which is what I would expect it to be sitting at most of the time. So it looks like it's worked out well. I knew those batteries weren't full because the boat hasn't been used for a little while because I've got an anti-foul and a whole lot of work at the moment. And I think this will be more than enough to keep that dual battery set up fully charged. My main concern with this boat is about the bilge pump always working and always having power. I am almost tempted to put a second bilge pump in because the boat lives in the water all the time. But that kind of gets me on to another subject of requirements when you're doing a job. And it's something I think I'm gonna do a bit of a midweek video. It's a little odd topic, but it's something I do wanna talk about. But I'll do that during the week rather than being one of the main sort of weekend maintenance or whatever videos. So I'll, I'll sneak that in. All right, we'll take care and I'll catch you soon. Bye. Thank you.